Hey, I'm Johnny. And I'm Chachi. And today we want to show you how to invite someone to church. Okay, here we are at Mission Control. We have our equipment, we have cameras over there and over there, and these are going to be real people Chachi's talking to, right? Yeah, real neighbors that I'm going to invite to church. All right, here we go. Okay, here comes an older gentleman. Do you see him? Yeah. Okay, who's that? That's Kenneth. He's a real hoot. Okay, this is a great opportunity for you to highlight how your church is primarily under 40 and how you lack the experience and wisdom that can come from someone older and wiser. Okay. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, let me do a sound check. Great. Okay, go, go, go. Showtime. Oh, hey, Kenneth. Can I ask you a question? It's Carl. Yeah, that, that's what I thought it was. I was going to ask you to come to church with me sometime because there's no one like you at my church. I mean, not even remotely. It was fine. It was more your delivery. It sounded, you said it in a negative way. Yeah, I okay. messed that one up. Sorry, Johnny. No, it's okay. Let's just try again. Okay, there, there's another guy. Who's that? Yeah, that's Samuel. He's a businessman in the neighborhood and he's working way too many hours. Okay, well, that's an opportunity to meet Samuel where he's at. Okay? Chachi. When you speak to him, make sure he knows that church is like an oasis compared to the daily grind of the office. Okay, it's nothing like work. Nothing like work. You got yeah, it? Yeah, I got it. I got okay. it. I'm ready. Sound check. Okay, I'm Sounds out of here. Good. good. Go, go, go. Oh, hey, Samuel. Beautiful day. Hey, man. I was wondering if sometime you wanted to visit my church with me. What time do you owe me? It's not your business. It sounded like you said it's none of your business. Well, I meant to say it's not like your business. It, it didn't sound like that. I felt like you got it. I didn't think this was difficult. Well, give me one more chance. Let's do one more. Okay. Hey, Johnny, Johnny. That's mm -hmm. my next door neighbor, Cam, and her three kids. They love me. This will be a great one. Okay. Well, your church does have a great kids program. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's do this. Okay. Tell them that. Basically, they're going to learn godly principles and that they'll get lost in all the fun. Okay, kids, lost, fun. Got it. Okay, all right. You want to check my mic one more time? It's great. Ow. Okay, be right back. Hey, look, there's Chachi. Hi, Hi Chachi. Kids. How y'all doing? Good to see you. Good to see you, Hi, too. Cam. Man, he is getting really, really big. I thought I'd come by and invite you guys to church sometime. Would you kids like that? Yeah! Church? Yeah, you, you should come to church with me sometime if you ever want to see your kids again. Go, go. I meant it's because you get lost in all the fun. Good, good talk. Talk to you later. Welcome friends and family members of First Baptist Church here in Hillsville. I hope you had a little smile on your face at the end of that video. But it is important, each and every one of us, to invite another to church to learn about Jesus and his plan of salvation for each and every one of us. We're going to start off our worship service this morning with two beautiful hymns. And I hope wherever you are this morning that you will sing along to Victory in Jesus and leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's all sing together these two beautiful hymns. Save a wretch like me I've 
Our scripture this morning comes from chapter 16 of Luke, verses 19 through 31. Jesus is speaking. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things and be likewise Lazarus bad things. But now he is being comforted here, 
and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, in order that he may warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone arises from the dead. You know, we live in a time, this day and age, where there's a lot of needs in our world. And, and as we come to our time of prayer this morning, I know there are many on our hearts and on our minds. There are many that we would love to lift up. And here is an opportunity for each and every one of us at the location that we're at to pray for those individuals. So let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, as we become before you so this day, we do so very humbly, knowing that you are the great I Am, the great Creator, the wonderful Counselor, the I Am. Lord, we pray this day as the great physician that you would heal our lands, because we know from your word that if we will repent, that you will clean and heal our lands. Lord, we pray for a revival throughout our nations where we would repent of our sins and our transgressions. Lord, we pray for our leaders to make wise decisions based on your word so that they can help lead your people. We pray, Lord, for those who are suffering loss this day, that your comforting hands would help them in this time of grieving. And we pray, Lord, for those who are sick and afflicted, that your healing touch would be upon them, that you would strengthen their bodies, that you would bring them comfort during this struggle. We pray for the encouragement for each and every one of their family members and loved ones. And Lord, we pray for our church, our church family. We pray for these times of uncertainty. And we pray, Lord, for your protection upon each and every one of us. Lord, we just pray for this service. We pray for our nation as well as our community. And we ask, Lord, that you would just protect us under your wings and that you would lift us up during this time of need. For it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Well, this morning, I'd like to start off and ask the question, are you heaven bound this morning? Do you have any doubts whatsoever where your eternity rest will be? So the question would for you this morning, are you sure you are heavenly bound. You know, in our world today, they say that a picture is worth a thousand words. But as in many cultures, there are a lot of sayings that we have. And some of these painters have captured their thoughts about their paintings and their pictures that portray a place or a time or event or some thought to others. Ellen Franklin Fowler says, Every canvas is a journey all its own. And Pablo Picasso said, Painting is just another way of keeping a diary. Frida Kahlo said, I don't paint dreams or nightmares, I paint my own reality. And Elaine de Kooning wrote, A painting to me is primarily a verb, not a noun. An event first and secondarily an image. 
We must love pictures and paintings that tell stories because the top 25 paintings ever sold in the world went for over $100 million each. The most expensive was by Leonardo da Vinci. It is called Salvador Mundi, which sold for over $450 million. The picture, if you can imagine, is of Jesus. And with one hand, he has his fingers in the form of a cross. And his other, he has a crystal spear representing the universe and the earth being in the palm of his hand and that he and he alone is in control. You know, I was never artistic or what you would call creative when I was in school learning. Uh, in fact, I could barely draw a straight line if I had a ruler. But this morning, I want to paint a picture for you. One that is priceless, but yet one that you too can own. It comes from the book of Revelation. It starts in 21, verse 18, and it reads, The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, and the seventh chrysolite. The eighth was beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temples. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practice abomination or lying shall ever come into it. But those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need for the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. Our picture is heaven, God's heaven, made for His loving Son that died on Calvary's cross to create a place of worship for all who believe in the Lord and Savior of all, Jesus Christ. A place where man and Father and His Son, along with each and every believer, can fellowship together as one, a place that is full of peace, love, and harmony, a place of true worship. As you listen to my words from the Scriptures this day, did my picture paint a thousand words? 
Did you see the pearly gates of heaven in your eyes? Did you wonder if your name was written in the book of life? Did it make you think about your spiritual walk with the Lord? We live in a day and a time when everything is upside down. Wrong is right and right is wrong. We live in a day and a time when we are destroying our history rather than learning from it. Many people question the existence of why we are here. What is life all about? And as our generations continue to be born and raised, many today continue to question either outrightly in terms of denial or question the existence of heaven and hell. Today, only 72% of the people believe that there is a heaven. That number drops to 52% when you ask about hell. John 14, 2, 3 tells us, Jesus told his 12 disciples, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know. In the way you know. Isaiah 66, 1 tells us that, Thus saith the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and my, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is my place of rest? Jesus tells us that his kingdom, that there are two decisions that we have to make in life, or one really. But they have two results. In Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, we see a story unfold. Jesus is talking about a transaction that has already happened. Two different men making decisions in life. The rich man and Lazarus. The rich man has all he ever wanted. He has all of the desires of the world fine foods on his table, the best linen for his clothing. He has a beautiful home, a large family and friends. Lazarus, on the other hand, has only the dogs to comfort him and his Lord. And although he's covered in sores and just seeks crumbs off of the rich man's table, he has hope. In the Lord. You see, in this time, the Pharisees considered wealth to be a proof of that person's righteousness. And so the richer you are, the more righteous you need to be, or you are. And thus, if you were poor like Lazarus, you must have sinned, you must be continuing to live in sin because God has not shown favor in what they call their eyes. Many people today in our own communities and in our own worlds and even in our own churches say, I'm a good person. I'm good enough. Surely God will take me into heaven. I've not done things wrong. I've tried to live a good life. But Romans 6.23 tells us that all have fallen short of the glory of God and have sinned. In our life story of Lazarus and the rich man, it talks about each one dying. Of course, the rich man has the regular burial type of services. But of course, with Lazarus, where he was poor and didn't have the money, he wasn't given that same opportunity for a nice burial. Chances are he was either taken out to the landfield and dumped or maybe possibly buried 
in a potter's field for the poor and the foreign. But then our story changes, and we see a role reversal. We see there in heaven that Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man is now struggling under the flames of hell that surround him. He is seeking that relief from the pain and the mental anguish that the flames of hell are bringing. Seeking even just a single drop of water to quench the burning thirst. But as we know from our story, there's no going back from the decisions we make here on earth. The decision as to whether we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That is the one reason we are here. To worship and to do and serve a living God. Is heaven real? Yes, it is. Is hell real? Yes, it is. Genesis 1.1 says, God created the heavens and the earth. There are many who try to say that God could not have created the universe or the earth or any of these things, that it was all part of a big bang or a part of all of this evolution. But ask yourself, from watching TV and watching movies and watching shows, the last time anything exploded, other than death and chaos and destruction, what did it cause? Did it perfect an a, a, a earth with the perfect climates for trees and plants, for rivers and for the sea, for wildlife and for the fish to grow and multiply as well as us? Did the Big Bang ever create a universe that could spin around itself without ever hitting each other? There is a higher being that has created all of this to work in harmony, and that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is God Almighty. Philippians 3.20 tells us, For our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus may have come the first time as a lamb, but He will come back as a mighty man of warrior. He will conquer the world. He will punish those who have fought against the righteousness of God. You do not want to be here on the day that God comes back. When Jesus comes upon that horse, because it says his tongue will be like a sword and it will slay those who have persecuted him. Acts 1.11 says, They also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. In the Old Testament, Jacob wrestled with the Lord. And it states in Genesis 28, 17, that he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. You see in verse 12 of chapter 28, Jacob sees a vision of the ladder that extends into heaven and where the angels of God are ascending and descending upon it. So is heaven real? You bet. Revelation 21, 1 through 6 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself 
will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, and the murderers, and the immoral persons, and the sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Heavenly blessings, oh, we will receive heavenly blessings if we call upon the Lord as our Lord and Savior. There's so much that we will expect and see and things that are going to happen in heaven. We know from Jesus' own resurrection that we will have a resurrected body. And as we saw with Jesus and His own disciples that had been with Him for over three years, when they first saw, they didn't quite understand who he was. There was a change in his body. And if it wasn't for doubting Thomas asking and being able to touch Jesus' nail-scarred hands and seeing the pierced side of his body, he may not have believed. But we are told throughout God's Word that one of the many blessings that we will receive will we give Heavenly crowns. There are five crowns that we will receive in heaven for being faithful here on earth. The first is called the imperishable crown for our enduring faith through all of the challenges of our life that we have stayed faithful to God Almighty. Our second crown is the rejoicing crown and we will rejoice over the blessings that God has given us. The fact that we are now dwelling with God Himself and that He has given us a life eternity. We're going to have a crown of glory because you see the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ, that bride of God the Father to His Son, the glory there will never fade. Our scriptures tell us that it doesn't need the moon or the sun to be illuminated because God and His Son will do the illuminating for them. And there will be no night. It will always be day. We will also get the crown of life for all that believe in Jesus Christ. And lastly and fifthly, we will receive the crown of righteousness for all who love Jesus appearing in His righteousness here on earth and called upon His name for Lord and Savior of their lives. We will receive that crown of righteousness. We will fellowship in the presence of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Word said we will no longer have any sorrows. We will have no more tears. We will have no more pain. I don't know about you, but my body is slowly starting to fall apart. I'm no longer that young lad that could jump and run and do all things and things seem to bounce off of. That Superman cape is no longer wrapped around my shoulders. And I would say it's probably the same for each and every one of us. We'll also no longer be separated from God because of the world around us, the flesh of our skin that continues to pull us away into sinful ways, sinful thoughts. We'll also have a rest that is only found in God. We will have God's rest. The land will no longer be cursed. 
It's like the Garden of Eden all over again. God gives us our rewards in heaven at what is called the Bema, or the judgment seat of Christ. It is going to be based on our faithfulness and service to Him. The rewards in heaven that we receive, we see fulfill the law of sowing and reaping in Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 9. It makes good on His promise that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And that our Lord and Savior shares with us His reward. Romans 8, 17 states, If we are children, then we are heirs heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If needed, he, we share in His sufferings in order that we may also share in His glory. When we are in heaven, we will share in His glory. Now I have painted a picture of heaven for you, but I would be remiss if I did not show you a picture of hell. Because see, your decisions you make today make a difference in your tomorrows. We are not guaranteed a tomorrow. There is a right and a wrong, whether the world around us wants to admit it. There is righteousness and there is wickedness. And for each of us, there is a decision that we and we alone can only make. The decision to choose Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because if we ignore Him, we will pay the consequence for our idolatry for our prideful and selfish ways, and for the illegal living that ways that we do. A punishment that is beyond all that we have considered. Maybe you were spanked as a child. Maybe you were stuck in a corner for a time out. And you didn't like those points and times. Well, that changes when you have the decision of heaven or hell. Because once you go to hell... The chasm between heaven and hell can never be bridged. I have a favorite writer called Louis Lamar. And he writes westerns. And he has the ability to describe scenes to the point where you almost feel that you're there. I'd like to describe one of his heroes that he probably would have described in his, his uh, story as I paint a picture of of hell for us. It would probably go something like this. Struggling to move forward step by step, dragging his book through the sand, being pushed ever forward by something I don't know, but longing for that opportunity to keep moving forward. the tongue swollen from the lack of water, throbbing in his mouth, tasting like sandpaper from all the sand from the desert floor. The radiant heat bouncing, not off, only off of his body, but dancing in front of him, shimmering in the light. Struggling to swallow. Blistered from the heat. Baked by the sun. Red from it all. Hell is an everlasting fire. An unquenchable fire. With shame and everlasting contempt. It is a place where fire is not quenched. A place of torment and of fire. The smoke of torment rises up forever and ever. Men and women shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which will be poured out without mixture into a cup of His indignation. And man shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Psalm 76.10 states, For the wrath of man shall praise you. With a remnant of wrath you shall gird yourself. Men may sit here and deny Jesus Christ on this earth, 
But when they go to hell or if they go to heaven, they will acknowledge Jesus as the one true Lord and God. But for those who wait till hell, it will be too late. You see, we have only one opportunity, that which is here on this earth. And John 3, 14 through 21 tells us of an eternal life through Jesus Christ and no other. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in Him has eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. I say to you today who do not believe or question whether they are saved, believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. Deny Jesus and you will spend eternity burning in hell. The decision is yours. No one else can make it for you. But you must decide who you will serve. Will you serve God or will you serve Satan? There's one last and final picture I'd like to paint for you. It comes in the form of a song and as you saw from the story of hell. You can spend eternity seeking the living waters of Jesus Christ, drinking from that ever-flowing fountain from the throne of God. Or you can suffer wishing that you could even get one drop of water. The song I'd like to sing for you paints another picture, and I hope this picture will resonate with you in your mind this day as we leave each other. And I hope it paints a picture of hopefully your tomorrows. It goes, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, Coming for to carry me home. Coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home, swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. If you get there before I do, coming for to carry me home. Tell all my friends I'm coming to, coming for to carry me home, swing low. Sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Brothers and sisters, I hope this picture is the picture waiting for you when your tomorrows are no more, when you have finally been called up into heaven for your roll call.
For those of you who have not made that decision for Christ, today is the day to pray that Jesus Christ would enter into your life, enter into your heart, and forgive you of your sins and of your transgressions. I pray that you will pray that sinner's prayer and ask Jesus to transform your life and that you would become a child of God. Because there are promises that God wants to give us. Blessings that He would love for us to receive. You know, that painted picture of a band of angels coming to come and get me warms my heart. And I hope it does you as well. As we finish this day, let's all sing together as we sing our final hymn. He lives. Oh yes. Jesus Christ still lives.